Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Liz Smith. You know her as Pete Buttigieg's Director of Communications and Senior Advisor. She has a new book out called Any Given Tuesday, A Political Love Story. Welcome to You Can't Beat Blue, Liz. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on your book, Any Given Tuesday. I, it's the best book I've read all year. In fact, I'm going to tell you, it's better than Pete's books and it's better than <sighs> Gaston's book. No comment. No comment. I said what I said. There's so much that's compelling about it. I've already talked to Gary about it when I was telling him, you know, you've got to read this book. And I've told him the things that really really moved me. Um, but I got to ask you, what's more exhausting, working on a presidential campaign or launching and promoting a book? You know what? Um, I I don't know if you like read my mind on this, but I have been telling people that the only thing that I've found comparable to a presidential campaign is doing a book tour. On a presidential campaign, I was behind the scenes. Um, but now I have to do all of these interviews, like Pete did. And I see how, if I say one thing that could be taken out of context, then Twitter runs wild with it, you know, and people say, oh God, I can't believe Liz said this. And it goes to show you that there is a lot that candidates have to deal with, a lot of BS. So, you know, Pete, I'm sorry for all those times I yelled at you for, you know, what I deemed subpar interviews, even though you are the best TV communicator in the Democratic Party. You write about how you and Pete made each other better. And I think yeah. that that's extraordinary. And, and how he came to remind you of why you got into politics in the first place. Can you paint that for us? A really important dynamic that I've found on campaigns is to sort of have a yin yang dynamic. Um, you know, I am seen as very outspoken, loud, you know, sometimes profane, out there, maybe dress a little wild sometimes. Um, whereas Pete is seen as someone who's very quiet, very understated. You know, he like, he can definitely shiv you, but he'll do it with a smile on his face. And um, for him, going from running for mayor of South Bend to running for president was a really big jump. And what I could help him with was bringing a little bit more of that killer instinct that you need to run for president and an understanding of how you work the media atmosphere, how you make the most out of this, how you break news, how you stay in the news cycle, how you lead the news cycle. Because one dynamic I write about in my book is, you know, either you feed the news beast or the news beast feeds on you. Mm -hmm. And he took to it quite quickly and, you know, became this, was an amazing communicator and amazing at figuring out how to do these town halls and to do these media interviews and really maximize them. On the other side of it, what he reminded me is that politics doesn't have to always be like that. Kindness and decency go a long way and can be rewarded by voters. He reminded me why I cared about politics in the first place. Whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or completely apolitical, politics touches every part of your life. It was a campaign I was really proud to be a part of and not just for what it achieved and what he achieved, but for the personal effect that it had on me. There are moments um, and days on campaigns where you just know you've got the wind behind you. <laughs> Can you describe a moment like that? The way that people used to feel about the old timey anchors um, is sort of how people now feel about podcast hosts because po podcast hosts are people that they let into their home. They let into their car every day and they develop this bizarre um, parasocial relationship with podcast hosts. So I put him on as many podcasts as I could get him on because I realized that his communication style, especially, and I hate to really get in the weeds here, but I haven't had the opportunity to discuss this. So I'm, I'm, I'm sort of excited to do it, but I realized that his communication style was tailor-made for podcasts because he speaks in paragraphs and not in sound bites. Mm -hmm. And on podcasts, that's where you really can get into the deep conversations. So we had built up this sort of like base, right? Where we started to hear, okay, people are 
tuning in. So then he hits the CNN stage for the town hall. And when Pete landed his line on Mike Pence. How could he allow himself to become the, the cheerleader of the porn star presidency? Is it that he stopped believing in scripture when he started believing in Donald Trump? I don't know. I don't know. The moment he landed that line, we were like screaming. And immediately we started to get reports back from headquarters and contributions through the roof. And Pete has talked about this moment when he walks back to the green room and all of our phones are just like exploding with texts. And I just remember him sort of whispering under his breath, holy shit, Oprah just texted me. And we'd set a goal for the quarter of raising $1 million, which is so cute and quaint. Within 40 hours, we had raised a million dollars. Within two weeks, we raised $7 million. Within two weeks, he was um, third in Iowa. And the way that Mike, our campaign manager, described it was that like we had warped political time um, and skipped eight levels um, of what you usually have to do to run for president. And it was amazing because essentially it was just Pete, Mike, me, and a monkey with a symbol on my campaign. I found Pete on the West Wing Weekly podcast. Oh my God, exactly. You see what I'm talking about is I, because I know the people who listen to that podcast are the people who tune in every week and they are die hard fans of it. And I have a, a, a bad admission to make. I've never seen the West Wing. I've never seen the episode of it. I'm the only person in politics who's never seen the West Wing, but I don't like to watch. I don't like, even though that was before I got into politics, I'm still really into politics. I don't find it relaxing to watch anything about politics. Even Veep, when I watch Veep, I laugh my ass off, but there's something very unsettling to me about watching something about it. It is not relaxing for me, yeah. so I don't watch political stuff, but I knew that if, if you were tuning in every week to that, then you are really wedded and committed to that podcast. And if you hear Pete Buttigieg go on there, then you're gonna like, be into him. You're going to be open to him. I want to end with a uh, kind of like a little round robin and just have like toss names out. Mallory McMorrow. Oh my God. Oh. Amazing. And I think she could be the first woman president. Same. Dr. Oz. Broad. Andrew Yang. Kind, smart guy who has lost his way a bit. Toby Keith. Oh my God. I've seen him live. Fucking love Toby Keith. I know his politics are all over the place, but um, I love Toby Keith. Courtesy of the Red, White, and Blue is one of my all time favorite songs. So love. Your father, to whom this memoir is dedicated, taught you the values of belief and loyalty. And you are your father's daughter. And Liz, your belief in the possibility of any given Tuesday, it means you always show up. And thank you for inspiring us to show up too. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me. Feel free to, free to swear as often as you like. That's what Oh my do. God, thank you. I always have to ask. Usually it's after I've said, called someone a motherfucker and I'm like, can I cuss? So it's good to lead with that up, up front, but don't encourage me. I, I, I don't need to, I don't need encouragement on cussing. <laughs>